Welcome to part two of lecture 18 of aerospace propulsion. So we left off with this question of why, besides weight, we want to keep a combustor short. The answer is that a long combustor would lengthen the engine shafts, right? The combustor lives between the compressors and turbines, so um, making it longer extends the, the length of the shafts in the engine. And if this get, got too bad, this could introduce issues related to the shaft stiffness or even the overall stiffness of the structure of the engine itself. So there's a real push to make combustors short. Now, what we've been thinking about is our normal turbine inlet temperature. This is actually the temperature into the first rotor, right? Because this, the T04 uh, is the stator outlet temperature. Of course, T04 is also uh, would be the stator inlet temperature if there was no film cooling, but there normally is film cooling in turbines. So we basically consider the first set of nozzle guide vanes or the stators to be part of the combustor. In that blade row, the gas temperature exceeds T04, but cooling flow from the compressor prevents damage to the nozzle guide vanes. Basically, combustor design is driven um, by the limits on a lean burn. All right, so you know, in, when we were talking about uh, internal combustion engines earlier in the course, we saw that uh, equivalence ratio is near one or what's commonly used, um, but the fuel air ratio required to get T04 uh, in the ranges that we want is roughly a third of that required for stoichiometric combustion. So with these conditions, normally the fuel wouldn't burn at all. There's just too much excess oxygen and air. So we need basically a rich ignition region and then to dilute it with air. And so we see that in this schematic of a combustor here where uh, there is only about 10, 12% of the air going into the combustor that initially gets into the ignition zone um, and then gradually more and more cooling and dilution air is added. The cooling air shapes the temperature profile that's going into the rotor. Basically we have stresses in the rotor blades that are going to be highest near the hub um, at the blade root because um, of the centrifugal stress because this is where most of the rotating mass has to be supported. Creep, you may have heard of, this is a deformation over time due to operation at high temperature in metals. So to avoid creep, we basically add extra cooling air near the hub. Uh, it's also good to cool the blade tips to, have, to help prevent them being damaged or eroded. So we add extra cooling there too. So we typically end up with a uh, radially, radially non-uniform uh, stagnation temperature profile going into the first rotor where it's cooler uh, at the tip and at the hub and hotter in the middle. Just like we saw in internal combustion engines, the slow laminar flame speeds of hydrocarbon combustion are a serious problem in gas turbines, right? 0.3 meters a second or so, it's just too slow. But for a different reason, right? In an IC engine, we needed fast combustion to get sufficient rate of heat release to be able to drive our expansion stroke at any kind of reasonable engine RPM. In the gas turbine, slowing the flow through the combustor down sufficiently to um, get to these laminar flame speeds would make the engine very large and heavy to accommodate the mass flow rate. So we need the flame to stay in one place with the engine or with the flow moving more quickly, right? So uh, ideally the flame should be stationary in space in a gas turbine engine. The solution to this is to place the flames in fluid recirculation zones. We can have these highly turbulent flow regions where we can get flame speeds up to about eight meters a second. And this can create regions where the flow is sufficiently slow um, you can sort of separate that by swirling the flow. So essentially um, swirl vanes will sort of add swirl to the flow going uh, and create essentially like a sheath of high angular momentum fluid around the combustion zone um, in order to, to help uh, protect the surrounding surfaces from the, the small and very high temperature region where the combustion is taking place. And you can see sort of the fuel and air injectors in the middle and then the vanes providing sort of a sheath of swirling air around it in these images here. That swirling flow essentially creates an isolated slow recirculation zone inside of it. So we have the primary air coming in here, there's some swirl, fuel injection, and basically you get this region of recirculation where the velocity is very low, and this is where the actual combustion is for the most part taking place. Now all that swirl and the flow recirculation invariably is going to lead to stagnation pressure loss. 
um, right? We're dissipating kinetic energy into heat by driving those recirculation zones. So there is typically a stagnation pressure loss in the combustor, and in a gas turbine engine, it's usually about 4% of the uh, combustor inlet stagnation pressure. The combustion efficiency in modern engines is normally very high. So we define this efficiency as the actual temperature rise divided by the temperature rise that would be achieved with perfect complete combustion. For modern jet engines, this is usually very close to 100% um, for high thrust uh, at sea level. Um, even at idle, it maybe drops to 99%, so it's still really good. Um, it'll be much lower during the engine starting and warm up processes. Um, but once we're at steady operation, it's pretty much 100%. So now let's think about what would happen if we had low combustion efficiency. So some kind of maybe a transient condition occurred that resulted in, in a, a drop in combustion efficiency. So you got a temperature rise much less than the ideal amount. What might happen to the combustion process and why? Take a few minutes and think about this um, before you move on to the next part of the video. And we'll also take this up in the tutorial.